I think we've got a, a decent shot of achieving um, full reusability of both stages, uh, the booster and the ship, uh, this year. Wow. Unbelievable. You did not hear wrong. This means SpaceX may catch two stages of Starship by Chopstick during one of the upcoming Starship flights this year. And what could be even more amazing than witnessing a scene that only appears in sci-fi movies? Something that is only in the dreams of SpaceX's competitors. Let's find out more in today's episode of Alpha Tech. Will Elon and SpaceX catch this giant rocket on the upcoming fourth launch? And why is it risky? What are the challenges SpaceX faces when catching Starship by Megazilla? After the first three launches of Starship, we can see that SpaceX has achieved many milestones and countless lessons. They have addressed mistakes throughout prior observations. SpaceX is focused on enhancing structural integrity, improving flight performance, and optimizing the efficiency of the launch pad. And finally, what they received were victories in their goals. They've successfully used the water deluge system, performed stage separation beautifully, achieved orbital velocity, demonstrated Starship's propulsion in space, and many other achievements. However, everyone knows that to perform a comprehensive launch, SpaceX has not yet achieved that. In the vast space industry, there's a saying that goes, what goes up must come down. But SpaceX only fulfilled half this saying. They've not yet landed the vehicle. Therefore, the upcoming flights will be the time for SpaceX to complete this milestone of Starship landing, specifically using the chopsticks to catch Starship. Currently, SpaceX has swiftly prepared for this, notably by constructing the second Starship tower to increase both launch frequency and facilitate rocket turnaround, while also addressing concerns that Starship's return to the catch tower could damage the launch pad in the worst-case scenario. Undoubtedly, SpaceX will likely swiftly execute this within the year as promised by Elon. But even before they reach this milestone, it's already a groundbreaking feat that's shaken the world. Why? For many years in the past, rockets burn up fuel in a few minutes and splash down in terrestrial oceans, having put their payload on the right trajectory. But this is wasteful, and that's why scientists have dreamt of building reusable launch vehicles. The holy grail of rocket launchers is a concept referred to as the single-stage-to-orbit vehicle. The idea is to use a reusable launch vehicle that can deliver a payload to orbit and re-enter the Earth's atmosphere and land where it can then be refueled. The process can then be repeated with a short turnaround. Sadly, the reality is that achieving orbit with a single vehicle and a pure rocket engine, whereby all fuel and oxidizer for combustion is stored on board the vehicle, remains out of reach. Even with a propellant mass of 90% of the entire vehicle weight, expendable launch vehicles must tread on extremely fine lines between the masses of propellants, the supporting vehicle, and the payload. This means that the payload mass that achieves the final orbit is typically no more than 2-4% to of the initial weight of the launcher. The only way we can currently achieve orbit is by stripping away the needless mass of the supporting structure and fuel tanks as the launcher's fuel begins to empty. This creates a multi-stage rocket. These stages may be in series, stacked one on top of the other, as in SpaceX's Falcon 9, or in parallel as in NASA's Space Shuttle. This wonderful technique helps the rocket to be partially reusable. However, that's not the limit. SpaceX has even better ambitions than other companies out there, as they want their rockets to be just like airplanes. Therefore, SpaceX has crossed the line by not letting Starship come to rest on their laurels, but by catching it with a giant mechanized launch tower named Mechazilla. As a result, the Starship is meant to be fully reusable and can carry over 100 tons to the Mars and Moon. Fully reusable and super heavy systems are expected to allow for space-based activities that have not been possible before, SpaceX writes in the Starship user guide. So, why did Elon and SpaceX choose to capture Starship with a chopstick? First, weight reduction. One advantage of catching Starship is the potential for weight reduction. Every pound spared on the rocket translates directly to increased payload capacity for orbital missions. Weight's critical in rocket design, prompting companies like SpaceX to prioritize weight-saving measures. When considering the possibility of catching super-heavy mid-air, the necessity for landing legs becomes obsolete. Given the immense size of super-heavy, the landing legs required to support its weight would be substantial. If SpaceX successfully implements mid-air catching for super-heavy and transports them to the launch pad without relying on landing legs, it eliminates the need for them. By doing so, the booster can allocate its saved weight towards carrying even more cargo into orbit and beyond. The second is launch speed. Another unique aspect of Starship is its pursuit of rapid reusability. SpaceX aims not just for a reusable rocket, but one that can be quickly redeployed. The ultimate objective is to have a Starship land, undergo minimal checks, and be ready for liftoff again in a short time frame. 
If SpaceX implements mid-air catching for Super Heavy and Starship, this process could be accelerated. For instance, if the booster were to land near the launch pad, traditional methods involving cranes and manual relocation would be time-consuming and could delay the next launch. However, by catching Super Heavy, SpaceX can swiftly position the booster onto the mount, expediting the entire process. Lastly, addressing Starship's vulnerabilities, Elon Musk frequently emphasizes the importance of simplifying complex projects. Specifically, when asked about Starship and its plans, he said, the best part is no part. For instance, Super Heavy's grid fins were initially designed to fold akin to Falcon 9's fins. However, SpaceX opted for a fixed grid fins to streamline the design and reduce complexity. Similarly, the decision to eliminate Super Heavy's landing legs follows this principle. These legs not only add weight, but also pose engineering challenges in efficiently supporting the massive booster upon landing. However, to catch the Starship with chopsticks, SpaceX first has to land it, so the fourth launch may not be the appropriate time for SpaceX to do this. In fact, with three launches and three explosions, we can see that the landing of Starship is still difficult, although SpaceX has landed many Falcon 9 boosters. Why is that? The big difference between landing a Falcon 9 first stage and Starship upper stage can be summarized as three main factors. These boil down to engines, fuel, and orientation. The biggest and most obvious difference is the attitude that Starship entry profile demands, which does something that no previous rocket ever attempted. That is to quickly and precisely transition from a horizontal orientation to a vertical landing stance. This means fuel and oxidizers that are always sitting nice and orderly in the base of the tanks and all other rockets are now sloshing around in a disorderly manner in the cavernous tanks of the Starship. This has necessitated the use of special header tanks to ensure the supply of a clean liquid flow, which is vital for a liquid-fueled engine. Normal aerospace wisdom uses inert helium to ensure the correct pressures are fed to the engine's turbo pumps. But Starship is different in that it uses autogenous tank pressurization where a bleed-off from the engines is used to send hot gas back into the tanks in order to maintain correct operating pressure. Because the nose cone section of these early prototypes is empty, the oxygen header tank has to be mounted as far forward as possible to get the overall vessel center of gravity correct, otherwise the craft is too tail-heavy. This, of course, makes things that are just a little bit harder to manage. Just getting the system sorted out to the point where it can maintain the correct fuel and oxidizer supply during this tricky maneuver was difficult enough on its own, but other complicating factors have to be ironed out as well. The next big factors are the choice of fuel and the new engines. Falcon 9, the derivative use of the trusty old Merlin 1D engine, fed on RP-1, basically high-refined kerosene, which has a tank pressure of just 3.5 bar. The Merlin 1D is a simple open-cycle gas generator engine, open-cycle on the C-level engines at least, that has just one turbo pump assembly that delivers both the fuel and oxidizer into the combustion chamber. The Raptors, however, are entirely different kettles of fish. These engines are unique in terms of flight in that they're full-flow stage combustion engines that run on methane. They have separate turbo pumps for fuel and oxidizer that have to be synchronized together and need a tank pressure around 6 bar to ensure adequate liquid flow to the pumps. In summary, you have a totally new landing technique where the vehicle changes its orientation by 90 degrees using a new type of fuel that's burnt in a new complicated engine that have no previous flight record. Just to add a little spice, the vehicle is constructed in a manner completely different from anything else flying out there and is built in tents by boilermakers. It can be a little difficult if you literally have to build the factory as you develop prototypes, but that's essentially what SpaceX is doing. Considering the rate at which they're churning out these test articles, I think you can excuse them from the old RUD. When you stop seeing these things disappear in a ball of fire, the next phase of development starts. And that's all for today's episode. Thanks for watching, and see you next time.